All right, now it's time for the trade secret segment of the show with Checkmate, a well-known Decred researcher who's going to introduce his take on the Decred on-chain analytics and talk about some of his preferred metrics for looking at the health of the Decred economy. Over to you, Checkmate. Thanks, Richard. Hi, everyone. I'm Checkmate. My, uh, so I'm one of the other pseudonymous Decred contractors. Um, which is quite an impressive model uh, that you can basically be a, a mystery and still still develop work and build value for a project like this. So in specific, um, I look at a lot of the on-chain analytics side of things, started a long time in, uh, in, in Bitcoin and have migrated across to Decred. And really the thing that attracted me was the, the interesting hybrid proof of work, proof of stake consensus, and really the different way that that shows up on-chain. So what I wanted to do is just take you through some of the the metrics that I look at and, uh, and, and myself and, and Permbul Nino, uh, who's another analyst, have been looking at and developing for Decred and just kind of understanding a little bit what the chain is telling us, kind of looking at the heartbeat of these uh, these crypto networks. So, I mean, for, for Decred, um, it, it does have a very distinct set of on-chain signatures and uh, it is actually quite different to that of Bitcoin. Um, and you know, I think probably the easiest and, and most uh, intuitive difference between the two chains is that for Bitcoin, a high conviction hodling signal really is just a single withdrawal transaction and then a period of dormancy, right? Coins not moving is actually a high signal um, position. Of, it, it's a strong hand maneuver, right? You, you're not shaken out by, by price action and coins basically remain dormant for an extended period of time. For Decred, however, with the hybrid proof of work, proof of stake consensus system, the idea is that high conviction hodling actually has an on-chain signature because it means coins are moving on a regular basis um, within the ticket system. It's, it, it's a signal of participation and actual you know, um, active participation in the network. So a Decred strong hand signal is actually an on-chain maneuver, whereas for Bitcoin, a strong hand signal is actually a lack of on-chain signal. So it's, it's kind of an interesting uh, balance between the two. And, and when you look at it from within that lens, there's a number of different elements. So whilst they both share things like proof of work and uh, you know and deterministic supplies, and they share some of those key features, um, Decred actually has a very different on-chain signature to Bitcoin, and that, that's really what what got me interested is looking at that that change between those two uh, two different consensus mechanisms. And you know, really, on-chain analytics is just looking at what is the network telling us block by block. What is the information and the data that's being reported? in terms of the health of the network, the utilization. And at the end of the day, it's about the psychology of the participants and the behavior of people behind every single transaction. Because, you know, increasingly we're seeing bots, but more than more often than not, there are human beings behind every transaction. And what do those patents tell us about the psychology of the network? So for Decred, I mean, a couple of example actions is, is buying a ticket, given that there's a, a, a pseudo random lockup period, and you are bound, you're, you are binding your savings to the chain, there's a strong desire to hold there. And it's actually a bullish signal when people are buying tickets. And we can use that information to decipher information about the chain. Um, likewise, for increasing transaction volume, there's a demand for block space being a positive signal. Um, once you end up in positions where the price is actually below the amount of income that the chain generates, so there's a block subsidy, there's fees, how much can the network actually support in terms of people who provide that security? Sometimes price goes below what is actually a profitable metric, and that would then increase the income stress, um, and there would be increased sell pressure. And likewise, for things like the protocol difficulty for proof of work, you get difficulty squeezes, which indicates that specifically the miners are under stress, uh, financial stress, and that unforgeable costliness um, is going to cause increased sell pressure. And we can use these signals to really understand the health of the network on, a, uh, on an aggregate broad scale. So the first metric that I'll take through is, uh, it, this is an old one. This is the realized price, which was originally developed by Coinmetrics. Um, and then just taking the ratio of that realized price uh, to give the MVRV ratio. And for simplicity, the realized price or the realized market cap is essentially a metric that tracks every UTXO and prices it at the time when it last moved. So it kind of ag represents the aggregate cost basis of the market. So every time a coin moves, it gets repriced. And if you think about it in a Bitcoin sense, when somebody withdraws that Bitcoin from an exchange, you can think about it being priced at that level and it represents that much, the amount of value that was saved at that particular time. And it won't be repriced until it moves again. So it kind of it represents that value that's been saved in the network. And really what we can look at here is how Decred differs because we know coins are moving on a regular basis. 
and there's a slightly different interpretation to that to that metric. So in, in chart form, this is what it looks like. You can see the price in uh, in black. You can see the real sorry, this is the market cap in black and the realized uh, realized cap in uh, in blue. And really, the psychology behind this metric is that ticket demand or that constant flow of DCR on chain is actually a measure of the cost basis. It's kind of where people are, you know, when they're locking up that high conviction maneuver to buy a ticket, they believe that price is, is undervalued at that point in time. So it's kind of a measure of their psychological cost basis. And we've seen that in a bullish market, bull conditions, we start to see that act as a support level. And conversely, it actually acts as a resistance level during during bearish market conditions. And we can really see this here. So at the bottom, we've got the oscillator, which is the MVRV ratio. And whenever price during a bullish market comes down and actually touches that realized uh, realized cap level, um, where you get that level of you know, MVRV is equal to one, it's acting as that support level through those bullish market conditions. And likewise, when there's a strong demand for DCR and people moving coins on chain, buying tickets or or, or pulling coins off to, to huddle for uh, long periods of time, you're getting that increased demand for block space. And because there's more coins that are moving on chain, the realized price tends to snap towards the price and you get this acceleration or a, a, an increase in the gradient during those periods of high demand because you've got more, more coins being repriced more, more often and you end up with this, uh, this steepening of the realized price, realized cap line. Um, the converse is also true. that Once we move into more bearish conditions, often people, if you, you know, let, let's say that your conviction starts to wane, you've purchased a ticket, at the time when those coins come back out of the system, your cost basis, you, you know, some people will be waiting to actually exit the market when it, when price comes back to their cost basis. And that's, again, what this realized price is showing. It's actually acting as a resistance as we move into that bearish condition. And I've highlighted two zones here where you're actually getting that the converse, where you get a steep gradient to the downside. And it actually indicates that lots of coins are moving on chain. It's probably a signal that you're getting a, because of the reduced price points, you've got smart money accumulating at the same time as weak hands are basically capitulating. So you get that double edge. There's more coins moving on chain because some people are accumulating, some people are capitulating, and there's somebody on both sides of that trade. So it does behave somewhat differently to, uh, to what we've seen with Bitcoin, where the realized price is kind of the, the price floor. It tends to set a new, a new price floor um, during bear markets and then will accelerate during bull markets. And you kind of get this stair-stepping pattern, whereas for Decred, you get a lot more of this um, kind of flow type system where the, uh, the realized price really is the mean. It kind of represents the mean and it's that support in bulls, uh, resistance in bears. And then for the um, when you get to these extreme values, you can start looking at historical uh, historical metrics, and you start looking for these key points of uh, of likely mean reversion. So when price gets too far away from the from the mean, you end up with a you know a higher probability of mean reversion, and that tends to work to both the upside and the downside. So the 142-day ticket sum, so we've, we've kind of touched on uh, the notion of decred tickets as a, that high conviction um, hodling signal. And for most tickets, sorry, for all tickets, they will vote. They will either expire or vote within a 142-day window. So the entire ticket uh, pool, you know, targets for 40,960 tickets, the entire pool of tickets will vote or expire within 142 days. So by taking a 142-day sum of all the USD that gets bound up in tickets, we're basically capturing every single ticket at every single point in time through Decred's history. So it's kind of a cumulative sum of all of the conviction and the strong hand conviction of, uh, of coin holders. So that's the relevance of the 142-day sum, and that's the reason why we're taking it of the specifically of the ticket value priced in USD. And what's quite interesting, that, that particular metric there, if we divide it by the coin supply to, to normalize into a, a pricing metric, um, that's that light blue line at the top that you can see. And the psychology of this thing is that it's really looking at um, the strong belief setting in, in price appreciation when people actually buy tickets. It kind of sets a, a ceiling price on where future price appreciation can go to. And we're actually seeing it act somewhat like a uh, like an upper Bollinger Band uh, for those familiar with technical analysis, where it kind of represents the upper bound of where price can get to before things start to get a little bit overvalued. 
And within that, we've then taken the uh, Fibonacci ratios of that particular metric. And interestingly, you know, um, often technical analysis and, and human patterns and things, for whatever reason, tend to revert to some kind of uh, uh, natural natural mean. And we see that these levels, these Fibonacci ratios of that metric actually then provide um, levels within that that, uh, that price tends to react to. And in particular, the purple line at the bottom, the 23.6, um, essentially represents a point where it's it's almost like a lower bound. And we can start to develop the, the oscillator at the base there, which is kind of the, the deviation around the 50% level um, to really provide an indication of where that ticket demand uh, is kind of setting that ceiling price and where things uh, you know are extending further away from the mean. Again, all of these metrics are really looking at where is psychology um, getting too euphoric or too bearish and, and, and capitulating and looking for those extreme reversion um, events. And we can see here again that once we move into these very, very far distances away from the uh, the mean or being the 50% line of this, um, you start to get um, tops in price as, it, as, as price actually approaches that ticket demand level. And conversely, you'll have a bottom start to kick in when we're talking about, you know, roughly 25% of the demand that's being uh, constructed by tickets. So that demand for long-term high conviction hodling um, sets that price floor. And when we're talking about 23.6% of the uh, the total ticket pool, the ticket pool tends to be roughly around 50% of all DCR in circulation. So if you're taking 25% of that, you're roughly talking about you know, 10, 15% of the entire circulating supply as a demand floor um, uh, is what that purple line is representing. And then the top line, the light blue, is kind of about 50% of the, uh, uh, of the total circulating supply. So prices tends to bounce around the demand level between 15% of the circulating supply and about 50%. The next metric that we'll look at is one that was developed by Permeable Nino. And uh, he, he's got a background in accounting. And what he really looked at is how these networks function almost as a Something like a cash flow, right? So there's there's the block reward that gets released for for decred in proof of work, proof of stake, and to the treasury. So there's kind of three arms, and then you've also got the aggregate, the total block reward that's coming out. And if we price each of those uh, blocks, the block reward as it's solved, um, we can look at what kind of uh, dollar value has been issued to the network, or what kind of cash flow does the network have. And as with any business or system, if you've got negative cash flow, if your current operating expenses are below your income, you're going to be underwater as an aggregate network. And that's really what these models are looking at is when is the is the uh, the decred network operating at cost? When is it operating under cost? And when do we get some kind of euphoric situation where it's you know well above the uh, the income stream? So if we take the cumulative sum of all of the US dollar denominated block reward issued for proof of work, proof of stake, treasury in, in, in total, we can start to develop these interesting lines and look for uh, you know where price and market valuation actually starts to react to these levels. And the psychology behind this is that you've got an aggregate cash flow and it's kind of the incentive cost basis for each different party. And each different party has their own different metrics. You know, proof of work miners have their energy and hardware costs, proof of stake have their uh, you know conviction and things like that. And we can see that under the orange line, when the market cap actually dips, dips below the orange line, the entire network on aggregate is actually now underwater. It's operating under a cost basis level. And if we then expand that to the, the red line, which is the proof of work miners, in particular, we can see that when the, when the market cap actually dips below that, you can sometimes, you know, you could almost push to say that the, the proverbial miners putting the bottom in when their expenses get to... Um, uh, overwhelm their income and you start to get minor capitulation, which we can actually confirm if we bring in the difficulty ribbon, you can see that compress of the uh, of the difficulty ribbon indicating the hash rate is starting to come off the network. Um, the miners are essentially over leveraged at that point in time relative to the incoming cash flow. And therefore, some of those weaker miners need to switch off their rigs. Stronger miners will gain an increased hash share and they need to they can sell less coins in order to maintain their operating expenses. So we can start to look at this cash flow model and combine it with on-chain metrics like the difficulty ribbon to really understand what is the aggregate behavior of these different supply side parties in the, uh, in the Decred network. So we can also look at things like the transaction demand to understand what kind of utility and 
and uh, motivation people have for actually using the decred chain. Um, and we can look at what actually, you know, the different mechanisms. Decred's constantly building new mechanisms by which people can uh, utilize block space and gain gain value out of the network. And we can start to unpick how each of those different mechanisms um, really plays into the demand metric and uh, and the health of the overall Decred chain. So one metric that I like to look at is the NVT and RVT ratio. Um, in the Bitcoin community, there's a lot of people who've uh, essentially pushed back and said the MVT and RVT slowly lose the signal as more coins are, you know, remain on custodial solutions like exchanges and custodial wallets and for that convenience factor. Um, for Decred, because a vast majority of transactions are actually driven by on-chain things, we've got the privacy mixing system, the DEX will be uh, implemented shortly, um, there's the ticket demand. It, it's a fairly on-chain centric uh, blockchain. You know, it's, there's a motivation to be using block space. So what the NVT and RVT look at is it takes the ratio of the market cap by the daily transaction volume. And for the RVT, it's the realized cap by transaction volume. And they tend to follow each other because we've already discussed that the, uh, the realized price and, and spot tend to follow each other for Decred because of that constant flow of coins. But what this is really showing, it's kind of equivalent to the PE ratio and, uh, you know, of a crypto asset. Where you've got how much utility, how how much is the uh, the blockchain actually settling in value on a daily basis, versus what it's currently valued at. Now, when you have a high ratio, it actually indicates that you've got a low relative demand, or the network value relative to the amount of actual uh, transaction throughput is out of balance and potentially overvalued. And you can see there's a few zones during Decred's price history where we've entered this kind of region. And again, a lot of these levels and things will change with time, but this is kind of the uh, based on the data that we have to date. And conversely, when you have a low relative demand, it basically means that there's a large proportion of, um, of value flowing through the chain relative to what the network is actually worth. And you can start looking for those points of actual undervaluation and, and, and use that in a uh, as, as part of your framework. And what's very interesting here is, is within this particular zone, as of August 2019, the Decred privacy solution actually went live. And what this has actually shown, you can see those two fairly substantial green boxes that followed it. We can start to indicate maybe there's actually a mechanism here that the demand for that privacy uh, privacy mixing service and the amount of coins that are then moving on chain as a result of that gives us an indication as to you know what the uptake is of the uh, of the privacy mixing or actually any, any feature that gets uh, implemented within the blockchain. So if we actually unpick that, that notion, we can look at the uh, the actual cumulative on-chain volume priced in DCR, so the amount of coins that are moving on-chain through history. Um, in orange, we've just got regular transactions. In green, we've got ticket demand. And then you can see in the, on the right-hand side an increase with the, the privacy release, which is shown in red. And we can actually see an acceleration from the date in which the privacy um, implementation was, was set live. There's actually been an acceleration in the demand for um, volume of coins moving on chain, and that occurs both in regular and in uh, in the privacy, specifically privacy mixing uh, transactions. And for reference, the green line is showing uh, to the uh, the right hand axis the proportion of the total circulating supply that's currently bound in any one of these particular metrics. And what we tend to see is about fifty percent of the total DCR supply tends to be locked up in in stake tickets. So there is that strong demand for that gamified proof of stake component. And for the mixing, mixing service, there's actually about 23% of the supply which has been mixed and currently remains unspent. Now, there's a lot more coins that have actually gone through the mix and then been spent or you know sent into tickets or, or anything else. But within a few months of, uh, of this privacy release being, uh, being un unleashed, We've basically got 23% of the supply that's gone through and is currently sitting there in a call it the anonymity set in that regard. So, you know, this gives us a good indication as to what the health of the network is and how it's actually performing over time, and you know how these how these different features are actually gaining uptick in uh, in adoption. And Can just I ask to, you about that one, yeah, absolutely, just, uh, yeah, about the so 50% of the supply is staked in tickets and 23% has been mixed and is on spent. Is that right? Correct. So that's of the 50% that's not currently being staked in tickets, almost half of that has been mixed and is just sitting there. That's correct. And I, I do believe that of that 23%, there will be some overlap between those two metrics because I believe that if a 
because the privacy solution has been built into the proof of stake uh, ticket system, if a mix occurs and then that results in a, uh, a ticket purchase, I believe that that ticket will be counted in both of those lines. So it's, it's kind of a privacy ticket, so to speak. I believe that's the current metric as it, uh, as it comes out of DCR data, which is where this, this particular data set comes from. Right. So it could include a good number of tickets that are live at the moment. Correct. Maybe spent once they vote. Correct. And as we unpick this data further and further, um, there's an opportunity to get quite granular and start looking at the, you know, what is that actual spread between tickets, just mixing? So th there is a lot of work ongoing on how we can actually unpick this into an even more granular level to just understand what the aggregate behavior is. What is the demand? How are people using the chain? Where is the, uh, you know, where are the value points? Where are people getting value from the, uh, from the, the features? Yeah, it's, it kind of hooks up with something I've noticed in my research recently on the, the on-chain stuff where there are some people that accumulate decent chunks of DCR in an address and then don't stake it. It just sits there. That's it. It does happen. Like So that's uh, it's uh, interesting that like listening to you talk about the, the realized value, like it's interesting that there is staking, which drives a lot of churn, but then there's also people that take the more kind of old school Bitcoin Total approach of just let it sit there. <laughs> Definitely, and and from what I've from from the research I've done, looking at these transaction demands and and what kind of transactions there are, I've put it down to about fifty fifty. It's about fifty percent of the the, uh, the demand base or block space is for tickets, and the other fifty percent is you know just spending uh, coins and, and and hodling traditionally. Now, some of that's going to be um, transactions that. You know, combine a number of UTXOs, which then go on to become a ticket. So there is a, a somewhat of an overlap um, between tickets and regular transactions. But in terms of actual raw block space demand, it is roughly about 50-50. And uh, you know, tickets form that 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 kind of base load um, of of demand. And actually, longer term, when we talk about uh, fee markets and and supporting the network long term. Um, what actually is really promising about this is seeing that you've got the the ticket demand, you've got the privacy mix demand, and all of these things are building a a base for fees. So as we see these demands roll out and we see more and more people adopting these particular tools, as a miner, in terms of the long-term longevity of you know your business and, and supply of the network, um, you can start to build reasonable models and reasonable understanding about what your future income can look like based on these these supply metrics. So it's one thing that really is quite promising uh, about the Decred chain in particular is that focus on on-chain utility and giving each transaction a, a, a real valid uh, um, long-term uh, value proposition. So it, it, it's actually good for the longevity and, and maintaining that 21 million fixed supply and a fee market long-term. So there's lots of lots of positive things to come out of this. So for Decred transaction volumes, we can actually break that down one step further and just look at the, the daily volume. And we can see that there's about 192,000 DCR that get purchased into tickets every day as, on a typical day. And we're already at a level where 110,000 DCR are being mixed per day, which again is quite a remarkable metric for a, a piece of technology that's only just been released, uh, you know, August 2019. So it just shows that there is the demand there and we are seeing an uptick in that as well over time. Yeah, it'll be really interesting to see what happens to that whenever privacy comes to discredit on. Most definitely, as you know, as these features get rolled out for uh, for, for retail, it becomes even more uh, you know more impressive. So the final metric we'll run through is the treasury performance. So the treasury really is the beating heart of the Decred network. It's how it remains self sovereign, um, and you know it's essentially bootstrapped itself from genesis to today. And the amazing part about this is we can see, you know, it is fully transparent and we can actually see the inflow outflow of this particular um, asset for the, for the Decred chain. So Decred never raised any money from, you know, from external investors, uh, token sales and things like that. It's essentially bootstrapped itself with its own treasury mechanism. And looking at the actual inflows in terms of DCR, um, what the balance is and then how much has been spent. What we can what we can essentially see is that we've spent roughly on the order of about 30% of the total inflow of DCR that's come in to date, equates to roughly around $7.6 million um, price spend to date. And that's pricing every outgoing transaction on the date when it actually occurred. Um, and that leaves a balance as of you know at, at $14 per decred. We're talking about $8.9 million that remains. So when you're looking at that, Decred's got at least a whole nother Decred that it could build 
um, if price was never to move again. Uh, and when you, when you look at the kind of tech stack that's been developed off that seven million, it's extraordinarily competitive compared to the field of you know many projects that have raised quite substantial sums, um, and we're still waiting for you know product releases and things. So Decred's really focused on bootstrapping itself from the ground up, and all of this is essentially priced by the market, which is a you know it, it's it's a fairly unique feature in the uh, in the space, and something that we should be quite proud of actually. And just to kind of give a, a final bit of context, with each ticket, we know that each ticket commands um, some value of that treasury. There's decisions that get made based on the value that's in the treasury. And this is just looking at for each ticket, if we look at the price of a ticket, which at the moment you know fluctuates between about 130, 140 DCR per ticket, how much value in the treasury is actually commanded by that particular ticket? And it equates to about 15.5 DCR. And if you look at that on a relative you know, ticket value, um, uh, value of the ticket, it's about 11% of the ticket value bound up. So if you're locking up 130 DCR, you're getting about 11% of that in voting power. And if you were to actually annualize that, and you know, assuming that every ticket roughly votes every uh, 28 days or a month, um, if you actually annualize that, it's roughly about 150% of your ticket value in, in vote power. Which, to be honest, is it, it, it seems quite reasonable when you appreciate it from that regard. It's you know you're basically getting your ticket value of uh, of control of the treasury um, over the course of an entire year. So that kind of gives an idea about the uh, the level of conviction that that stakeholders have long term. So just to kind of wrap up, uh, so the Decred blockchain does have a unique blend of machine consensus in proof of work and human consensus in proof of stake. Holding DCR and participation in the governance system, is it really is a high conviction signal and it gives us a good indication of network sentiment. And the cost basis models really provide insight into where there's economic stress or euphoria for various stakeholder and participants and where we can potentially expect that reversion towards the mean uh, from that from that perspective. And there is a great deal of value and importance placed on good governance by the Decred DAO. And really the reason that I'm here and why I look at this on-chain data is to try and provide stakeholders with the insights, tools, and data on which they can actually make and base good decisions, right? The more information you have, the better the decisions you can make. That's great. Thanks very much for coming on and sharing those insights, Checkmate. And that's it for this extended version of Trade Secrets at Decred Foundations. Consensus distributed. Goodbye. Decred is secure, adaptable, sustainable. Learn more at decred.org.